It's Freedom Files with James Burns. Welcome to the Freedom Files podcast for this Thursday, February 9th, 2012. I am James Burns. We are joined now by Bob Chapman, his website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Bob, how are you doing today, sir? Well, pretty good, pretty good. There's a lot for us to go over this afternoon in the short time we have together. But first off, I'd like to go over what's going on economic-wise in Europe. According to Reuters, I know they had this thing going on for a while now, and we've talked about it several times. They've reached some sort of bailout deal. Uh, just in time for this EU timetable, the Greek uh, political leaders clinched a long stalled deal on reforms and austerity measure. Uh, how bad is this deal going to be for the people of Greece? Well, first of all, um, has it been passed? It says that they've reached a deal. It doesn't say it's passed yet, though. But okay, I mean, they're, well, yeah. Uh, the chances are it won't be good for them. Well, uh, it's a 70 30 deal. And um, 70% of the debt will be blown off. Uh, they'll have to lay off 150,000 people. Um, they'll be in depression probably 30 to 50 years. Whereas if they went bankrupt and said we're defaulting, it might have take them five years to come out of it. And so uh, I... Uh, it's very, very, very bad for the Greeks. You now we got a new election coming up in April, and they may uh, rescind it. They may say, no, no we're not going to do that. So we'll find out. But it's really a terrible, terrible deal. I mean, they can't even generate enough revenue to stick by and... Um, and pay, uh, play, uh, stick by and, and um, complete the first deal that they did on the first bailout. It, it's impossible. They, they get hardly anything to export. They just get tourism. And, um, you know, there's competition problems. and it, uh, There's no end to it. They should have been left alone in the first place. And, uh, of course, this is uh, the current sellout government that's in there. And uh, I think it'll all be reversed. If it isn't, and I was Greek, I'd leave town. Yeah, it's a serious situation, what's happening in Greece. And it looks like that they're about to get a really bad deal <laughs> shoved down their throats. And how is this going to affect the rest of Europe, Bob? Well, um, the Germans and French are still going to have to right off about 25 billion each and uh, all together I think uh, they'll have to uh, the, the, the banks and the governments have to uh, uh, give away uh, probably about two point uh, 280 uh, 280 billion dollars so wow. you know they're gonna take a hit too but even the remaining 30 percent there's no way they can pay it back that's just amazing, this scam that they're pulling over the people of Greece and of the entire, you know, Eurozone. Yeah, that's right. And I told them what to do, and, of course, the people who agree with me, they're not in power. They will be in a month and a week or something. But i got to see that thing get passed first. I see whether they'll pass it. Yeah, well, hopefully it won't pass, but you never know how it goes, especially – when they have the wrong people in Parliament, you know, running things from behind the scenes. And it's just, it's just a tragedy to see what's happening not only in Greece but throughout the rest of Europe and the rest of the world altogether. And, um, you know, speaking of the economy and uh, different settlements and deals, it uh, looks like this uh, mortgage settlement, Bob, uh, is nothing more than a scam from the way I'm looking at it with uh, what it's going to be, what, a uh, $26 billion settlement, but only $5 billion is going to be paid by the banks and the rest of it's coming out of our pockets. I mean, it's not even going to hurt these mega banks, and it looks like that the enforcement over all this is nothing more than a big, fat, ugly joke. That's right. Nobody goes to jail, and they pay chump change. 
They should have paid fifty billion minimum, and it should have been uh, criminal charges brought. It, it, look, right now uh, there's a movement uh, among the Illuminists, and they want to do away with the U.S. Constitution. That's the latest. I mean, that's been their goal for quite some time now. I mean, that unfortunately, you have what what Judge uh, Ginsburg. She went to Egypt the other day, and she was talking about how they shouldn't use our Constitution because it's old. I mean, here's a woman who swore an oath on the Constitution to rule on the court, which is supposed to be all about the Constitution and Bill of Rights, yet she basically just stabbed it in the back. I mean, why aren't people rallying in the streets calling for her resignation from uh, the Supreme Court? Well, they don't even know what happened. News blackout. Yeah, and the sad reality is that's the way they have the people controlled, as you and I both know, Bob. I mean, people care more about uh, the latest reality show, musical, or uh, the baseball season coming up. And that's for sure. I mean, yeah, definitely. They are showing no quarter to the Constitution and Bill of Rights. They're attacking it from all angles. And let's see, it just came out that what the uh, this FFA, the, the FFA, well, FAA, <laughs> <laughs> their reauthorization bill passed the Congress last week, and it turns out that there was something inside this reauthorization, which is becoming a norm. Uh, 30,000 drones uh, set to be flying over the skies of the U.S. by 2020. And I saw another example. Oh, yeah, and according to the uh, DHS and FBI, Bob, the police now have some new warning signs for potential terror suspects, people likely to commit violence, and those who speak out against the government, which is a lot of people these days, people who blame the government for their perceived problems, unusual extreme actions that caught attention of others, and active online people that are showing extreme views and connecting with other people throughout the Internet. Sounds like a real notorious group. I know. But they're definitely shredding they wanna, the, what's they left. They want to silence everyone is what they want to do. Exactly. And they're using fear and intimidation and paranoia to, to try and quiet the masses, especially the growing number of people out there that are speaking out online and in person. And it's just another prime example, as you talked about a moment ago. They're going after the Constitution by every single angle possible. That's right. And it will be relentless. They want to destroy the country. Well, everybody slept. I know. It's just sad to see that, you know, in the, this dark time right now, when we could turn things around, that a lot of the people just don't care. And, and here's another example, another attack on the separation of church and state. You know, Obama taking on the Catholic Church over uh, these mandatory birth control rules, you know, in Obamacare. And now you have the Dems. They're saying that they're going to fight strongly because this is what they say, Bob, because free birth control and abortion pills is a natural human right. Oh, that's ridiculous. And then I came across this other thing, Bob, is Ron Paul actually came out. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, Ron Paul came out blasting Obama and the GOP rivals on these contraception mandates. This is what he had to say, quote-unquote, forcing private religious institutions to pay for contraception and sterilization as part of their health care plan is a direct assault on the First Amendment's guarantee of religious liberty. Ron Paul goes on to say, I am the only GOP presidential candidate who has consistently opposed the federal promotion, funding, and mandating of contraception and abortion. So another prime example, Bob, how they are coming at us at every single angle possible. That's right. And uh, you want to change things, and the Republican National Committee rigs every primary. Crazy. It is. It's insane, especially with what happened over the weekend in Nevada in that caucus. I mean, Ron Paul basically has been doing very well in the votes, despite all these shenanigans and obvious instances of voter fraud. I mean, he's been getting way more votes this time around than he did in four years ago. But in Nevada... He only had a gain of 88 votes. <laughs> I mean, that that just stinks right there. Well, there was one area, Las Vegas, uh, middle income, tough income. And uh, they had the voting at uh, a synagogue. And uh, it's a predominantly Jewish area, which usually doesn't vote Republican. 
And uh, one of our subscribers, his son, worked on the committee that counted the votes. And uh, Ron Paul got twice as many votes as anybody else. And they sent the votes in to the tolling place, and that was the end of it. They had never even seen any reporting. It's incredible. Yeah, it absolutely is. And from what I heard in that special, uh, that special caucus that they had, uh, they were actually turning away non-Jewish voters, even though that's uh, what turns out to be discrimination, which is illegal in this country. They were turning away people that wanted to come in and vote. And so on top of that, along with these votes that magically disappeared into the, the desert, I guess, Bob, along with everyone else that's had a bad luck in uh, Las Vegas, in the city that never sleeps. So, yeah, it's just more shenanigans going on from behind the scenes. But, but despite that, there is some good news. Despite everything going on, despite the attacks from the mainstream media, the GOP neocon establishment, and more potential voter fraud, Ron Paul is apparently winning the battle for delegates. He's poised to pick up even more delegates from Minnesota and Colorado, which had theirs the other night, adding to uh, his delegate total altogether from Iowa, New Hampshire, and Nevada so far. And even more good news, Bob, he's also placing second place in the national polls versus Romney. Also, the states yet to come, and there's a lot of them, uh, all of them are large vote states, and all of them he's very strong in. So um, what you've seen probably is the worst. Uh, I'm just uh, I'm just surprised somebody hasn't gone to a federal judge and got in, got cease and desist against the Republican National uh, Election Commission or whatever it's called. Uh, they should shut them down. They should cut them off. And, you know, they can, people can do the votes, but they, they can't be allowed to rig it like that. And it's so obvious. It absolutely is obvious. And it's just right apparent and in our face. And the good news is uh, Revolution PAC, which is a pro Ron Paul super PAC being headed up by Gary Franchi, is taking action against all this voter fraud. They're hiring a firm to uh, do exit polling for now on in all these primaries and caucuses. So it looks like that we may have a little bit more examples of keeping an eye on what's going on you know who watches the watchers so hopefully that effort won't be in vain and it will result in a little bit more honesty coming out in the uh, future primaries and caucuses but you're right bob we still have a long ways to go in this race and with what happened the other night with rick santorum winning that actually helps us because it kept mitt romney from gaining those delegates and it's kind of funny that four years ago mitt romney did very well and the Minnesota and Colorado caucuses. He came in first place. Four years later, he didn't even place – I mean, he got beat by Santorum, and this is supposed to be the front runner, so it's not helping him. And in the long term, I think it's going to help us. Well, I think that was a tactic uh, by the Republican National Committee that backfired on him. Uh, there was no way that Santorum could have got those kind of votes. And uh, I, I just think the whole thing just jumped up in their face and uh, destroyed them. It'll it'll come out. <clears throat> I'll tell you one thing: we don't get Ron, we get a problem. Yeah, a huge problem because the reality of the situation is there is no difference between Obama, Romney, Santorum, Gingrich. They're all basically one and the same. There's small differences, obviously, but the point is the big picture is if we get Obama another four years, or we get one of these clowns for a term. They're just going to pick up exactly where Obama left off. That's true. I do have an important email question, Bob. Uh, this one came in from Heather. She wants to know, in your opinion, what is the most important issue or issues that Ron Paul is bringing up in this presidential race? Well, there's no question it's the Federal Reserve Act, and uh, the Fed has to be done away with. And if we can accomplish that, we can get rid of lots of other things. But that's the number one issue. I mean, there's a lot of good issues, but um, I think that's number one. I just wrote an article, uh, it'll be in Sadie's issue, and I talk about the Federal Reserve assisting Obama in his uh, move to a second term as a president. And uh, I said that the, the Fed was orchestrating the loosening of money and uh, so that uh, Obama would look good going into the election. Uh, lower unemployment, 
I expect them to, to lower the M, uh, the U3 uh, numbers down to um, seven to seven and three eighths percent. It's eight and three eighths right now. I think it be, could be at that level in October because they lie about everything, and then they're going to tell us that inflation's two percent when it certainly is not. And of course, uh, they'll they'll do other things like QE3. I mean, the the sad news here, Bob, is all this is comical. I mean, I came across this as well. They're how they're planning on lowering the jobless rate. <laughs> how they said it's stale. You know what? They're half right. It is stale. But in my opinion, uh, in your opinion, Bob, the unemployment numbers are way higher than what they're they're presenting us. They're lying, just like you said, and that that's being nice about it. Well, that's right. And um, there's nothing to stop them. Uh, we, our government, and our international business and Wall Street and banking are run by a commonality of people in a criminal syndicate. Yeah, I mean, it's just sad, especially when you have the mainstream media basically, you know, marching, you know, side by side with them, not contradicting them like, uh, you know, credible news organizations should do, you know, come out and say, wait a minute, the president says this, but when we went and did our research, that didn't turn out to be the case. You don't have that with the mainstream media. They're they're basically following the same script as Obama in the White House is, and most of Congress, unfortunately. And that's the problem. That's a big reason why so many people are duped into believing the lies. That's right. And, you know, they, the public doesn't try hard enough to understand. They could if they wanted to, but they're not. Some are, but and, and, and we're, we're making great headway, but not as deeply as I'd like that is one thing I see that we're doing here in this movement, the uh, the alternative media, what you've been doing for decades and so many others, is you're not only informing the people about all this, you're also actually educating people. With all your newsletters you send out, with all the radio shows you go on, you're educating those of us who you know, are still trying to learn more and more about this. And I don't claim to know everything, Bob. I'm Every time we're on the air together, I try and learn more and more stuff than I did the week prior. And... It's just amazing that we have so many people out there like yourself, Ron Paul, and others basically giving lectures to the people, helping us get a better understanding of how things are really transpiring. Well, that's true. And it is a good thing that you have so many people out there that are willing to listen, especially young people. I mean, so many people are going to Ron Paul rallies, and that's what Ron Paul rallies are basically all about. It's not the typical you know, cliche that you get from all the other talking head politics that are in these empty, priceless suits. He's actually instructing people, teaching people about the economy, about the problems in this country, about what we can do to turn things around. And people are listening, and that's going to go a long ways down the road. Uh, you're right. If they don't put them all on internment camps. Yeah, that's the fear. I mean, they're, they're ramping up this police state at a very alarming rate with these reports of drones coming out now, you know, adding more things to the list of what to be suspicious of when it comes to people. I mean, it, it seems like you can't get away with almost anything on their list without being a supposed suspect terrorist. And as you and I both know from the uh, signage of the uh, latest National Defense Authorization Act, I mean, they got some pretty scary stuff in there. That's right. And I, I'm just sincerely hoping that we still have some time left to turn things around before it does get as bad as it did in the Soviet Union and in Nazi Germany? Well, uh, the harder we work, the more results we'll get. I think so. I think there's a big difference between what's going on here and what went on in those countries because most of the people that went along with the, the communists in the Soviet Union and most of the people that went along with the Nazis, they followed them, you know, and did exactly what they were told. And those that, that were against what Hitler and what Stalin were doing, they kept their mouths shut out of fear of being hauled away to the gulag or a concentration camp. And that's not happening here. You have plenty of people that continue to speak out and stand up, such as yourself and others and many people across the country. And all, all the intimidation they put out, all the fear that this government tries to you know, propel upon the people isn't working. Well, the general public, to some extent, it is because of the television and um, non-inquiring minds. But uh, otherwise, uh, there are some real breakthroughs, and um, 
And that's what we have to capitalize on. That's very true. I mean, there is definitely victories happening left and right. Not, and I see a victory this way. You, you go up to 100 people and you talk to them about Ron Paul and say 99 out of 100 don't care. But you find that one person that you woke up that wouldn't have been a Ron Paul supporter beforehand. I see that as a victory, Bob, a victory of attrition, one person at a time. Well, that's the way it's done, unfortunately, because uh, it's difficult. You know, it it takes is. It so much longer. I know. But, I mean, the good news is we, we do have the Internet well for now. <laughs> I mean, Sopa and Pippa, they failed, but you know that they're probably working on something else. They're not going to let that go away. They never do. Anytime that we manage to defeat one of their latest schemes in Congress, they always come back at us twice as hard with even more propaganda and lies about it. So that's probably in the works as well. Plus, this I think there was something passed uh, internationally that Obama signed as well, which basically is even worse than those two. Um. If I saw it, I forgot it. There's so much bad stuff coming down the pike that uh, you get shocked every day. Oh, I think this um, business of abortion has put them directly against the Catholic Church. That ought to be something. I think that'll uh, make a dent in there. But I, I think the underlying problem with the possibility of election of um, the... Um, President, uh, he's um, he's going to have all of this money working in his favor, and it's endless. And then on top of it, there's so many people out there that want something for nothing. I mean, half the population doesn't work and pay taxes. I mean, how long can you last with that sort of situation? In 1940, it was about 15, 20 percent. I mean, you have yeah, I mean, people in the country on food stamps, and they're going to extend uh, the uh, extended unemployment, and, and, you know, it just goes on and on and on. It doesn't stop. You're right, Bob. I mean, it's definitely – I see it as a two-pronged issue. One thing is they've obviously been conditioning people to depend on the government for the past several decades now, you know, getting their hands out, hands out without, you know, getting anything in return or having to work for it. But I also see it as a means to keeping the population under control. Those that would be riding in the streets right now because of the economic situation with the you know, growing number of unemployment, more people losing their jobs and homes, you know, it's just a way to you know, throw you know, some scraps to the, to the plebs, basically. I, you know, I, I, I'm thinking back to this uh, situation with Greece. It's going to be interesting if it's passed and then following that what the new government's going to do. The president from the new government will be Mr. Samaras. That's the new Democratic Party. And he has said he's going to go uh, to investigate all of the government employees since 1974. Wow. That's going you way back. Seen anything yet. What do you think the lessons that we can learn from what's happening in Greece Bob, what do you think that we could learn from what's transpiring there over the past couple of years now? Well, it's going to happen here, too. That's the big lesson. <laughs> How far <clears throat> down the line? Two, three, four years. Everybody expects it to jump up and happen tomorrow morning. And it's not going to. No, I don't see it that way either. I mean, it's basically the calm before the storm. I think that it's going to be, you know, slow. And once it gets here, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be groundbreaking. It's going to be earth shattering and it's going to be overwhelming. And a lot of people are going to, who are not paying attention, uh, they're, they're going to be caught completely off guard. And there's just so many people out there that don't have their priorities straight. While there is a growing number of people in the populace that are waking up to all this, are actually starting to learn more and more about the situation around them. You know, there's just going to be a number of people, and I'm sure this is the same scenario that happened in Greece. They were just caught completely off guard. Well, they knew of the endemic uh, corruption for many, many years. They just didn't understand how deep it was, I don't think. I mean, there's been trillions of dollars stolen. I mean, the worst of all was uh, Anders Pompeo, who was the father of uh, the guy that just resigned as president. Uh, he was a communist, and... 
and everything that wasn't nailed down, he took it. Uh, just, yeah, you know, people like that are unfortunately a dime a dozen. These white collar, you know, elite criminals, and it's just funny how they can get away with doing just about anything, and yet you you have a small time uh, mugger or robber. Yeah, they get caught by the police, and justice is served. They go to jail, but not these guys. No. And nothing major changes. It's not going to change at all. They're going to do what they want. Yeah, I mean, it's there's something has got to give, Bob. There, something has got to happen somewhere down the road, sooner or later, that's going to be that spark that finally wakes up a large enough percentage of the population in uh, the U.S. and in Europe and across the world that finally rallies people against these crooks and these monsters. And I, I don't know what it's going to be, Bob, and I know you probably don't either, but something's got to give. Well, I don't know what the catalyst will be, but uh, things happen that are not supposed to happen, and uh, maybe we'll get lucky or maybe we'll get some divine help. I think we could sure use it. But I think, you know, the people really deserve it. That's another thing. You know, their, their lives are so immoral. You know, you got to say to yourself, why do we collectively deserve a break? We really don't. I think, I think a huge aspect of that is the fact that we as people have become less responsible for ourselves and less responsible and aware of what's going on around us, not only in our community, but in our country and in the government itself. We vote these people in, and we don't bother to go do any homework on them. We vote them because they happen to be Republican or Democrat, our, our favorite party, whichever one we pick. And then we, we let them go to D.C., and we don't keep tabs on them. We don't keep an eye on them. We don't hold their feet to the fire. And so that, in my opinion, Bob, has allowed them over the past several decades now to just do whatever the hell they want in D.C. and, you know, make as much money as they want and make as many backdoor deals as they want and, you know, pass as many police state laws as their heart desires. I think there's going to come a time when they don't have any laws. It's whatever they want. Yeah. And you're, you, hit, you hit the nail right on the head there, Bob. I mean, what's the point of laws if we have to follow the law, yet if you're worth a couple of hundred million dollars or a couple billion dollars, and you're a corporate suit or a bankster or a you know, politician, you don't have to follow the law. I mean, there's, there's just no point anymore. We might as well just have anarchy. And we probably will. That's where they get their camps built. I saw something interesting today from uh, uh, the newspaper in Bulawayo. Now, I'm sure all of you people listening know where Bulawayo is. And it's the second largest city in uh, Zimbabwe. And I used to live in Zimbabwe. And the Bulawayo newspaper said yesterday that Mozambique uh, and um, what's the other country? Um, uh, Angola. Um, they're volunteering to bail out Portugal. Now, that's hard to believe. I've been in both, both countries many times as I lived in South Africa and Rhodesia. And incidentally, the banks and... Uh, Zimbabwe right now don't have much cash, and they're limiting cash payouts to, like, if you wanted two thousand dollars, and these are in dollars, um, in U.S. dollars. Um, I don't know what the ingredient is. We'll we'll say they give you five hundred, but that's what's going on. Most banks don't, don't have any cash, and the ones that do are rationing it. But I thought it was funny that um, Angola and Mozambique uh, were making that offer. <laughs> and um, I wouldn't want to live in either of those places uh, because I spent time there. It's just uh, not a nice place to live. What exactly is going on in Portugal, Bob? Uh, could you enlighten us to what their situation is down there? It broke. Is uh, the uh, situation there so bad that <laughs> you have other broke countries in uh, Africa offering to help them out? I mean, it's just, that doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, the moment you told me that, it was like, what? 
I mean, obviously these countries aren't doing very well either, and it's just I don't I don't get how they're going to be able to help out another country that's broke when they themselves are. Well, I it might it might have been tongue in cheek as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do know the situation in uh, Mexico is coming to a head, and it's something you've been discussing as well. You know, the battle between pre and pan for uh, control over Mexico. Uh, have you uh, been keeping eyes on that lately, Bob? Yeah. Um, first of all, um, pre controls the House and the Senate, and the presidency is held by pan. And when you look at the situation, uh, you see several client, um, several persons who might become the nominee for a pen. And they're all, I would say, mostly lightweights. Uh, but as far as Pre is concerned, the chief guy that is running is brilliant, he's a great speaker, he's very smart. And he's as handsome as sin. And um, he's going to get a lot of female votes, I'll tell you that. And this guy is um, movie movie quality, good looking. And so uh, PRI will win. I think the uh, arrangements are being made now with the uh, narcotics people to stop all the crap that's going on. And that will change. It's, it's cost the country, I would say, probably probably about $15 billion. Inflation's heating up in Mexico. It's a little over 4% right now. And it's it's been, you know, three and a half. So they got to contend with that. Uh, the main problem for, uh, with that is that they've had a drought in Mexico. And it's affecting food prices more than anything else. I have an article for Sandy's issue on that, incidentally. I've been hearing a lot of uh, reports about another candidate running in uh, the party, uh, this uh, woman, uh, Josefina Vasquez Mota. What is your take on her, Bob? I really don't know. All I know is she doesn't stand a chance. Yeah, she definitely doesn't because she's running under pan, and they're in serious trouble, as you've pointed out time and time again. Well, she's, uh, she's a good person, and she's got a good background. And uh, I know the district that she comes from. And um, she's not going to be president, but I'm sure she'd be helpful in other capacities. So in the, let's do a little comparison real quick between what's happening in Mexico with their presidential elections and us with ours. Who do you think is going to uh, end up on top, Mexico or the U.S., by the end of uh, the election cycles? On top in what sense? Now, uh, better or worse or about the same? Well, I think Mexico will end up the best, uh, no question. They haven't had the damage done to them that the U.S. has had. So they've got a big advantage. And only 200 million people, but no, 100 million people, excuse me. Uh, and that's not a lot. When you look at 312 million or whatever it is, that's uh, one-third the size by uh, numbers. Or people, but most of the poverty of the past is generally gone. Yeah, the, the situation does seem to be slowly but surely changing for the better in Mexico. Meanwhile, we seem to be going in an opposite direction, unfortunately. Well, that's by design. Definitely. Most of this stuff, sadly, is by design. It's all part of the plan. And uh, switching gears to uh, Middle East, to what's happening there with the tensions rising with Syria and Iran, and it looks like this came out earlier today that Israel's Mossad has been working with the People's Mujahideen of Iran, which is a terrorist group, according to the U.S. They've been teaming up to kill Iranian nuclear scientists. And uh, Madonna fans, you'll get a kick out of this, Bob. Madonna fans in Israel are begging Prime Minister Netanyahu to postpone any plans to carry out strikes on Iran until after her May 28th, 29th concert in Tel Aviv. Whose concert? Madonna's. Oh, she belongs there. <laughs> um, oh. That is spectacular of uh, devil worship 
at the Super Bowl was dreadful. Uh, most of the people don't know what it was about. They don't understand that stuff. And uh, she's really evil. But, yeah, it was just a... It was amazing, Bob, because I'm not I'm not too fluent on all the rituals and the occultic stuff, but I know a little bit about it, just enough to saw it for what it actually was that night of the Super Bowl. The way everything was performed, how she did the right moves, the the way they had the lighting and all that. I mean, I was like, well, this is very very occultic. Well, be as it may, um, the Mossad is working everywhere in the Middle East, recruiting people, uh, killing people. Uh, you know, like any other dictatorship, like the United States and so on. It's, it's amazing to me, Bob, that Iran hasn't openly just declared war because of what's been going on. And it's just sad to see that this whole thing is spiraling out of control right before our very eyes. And looking at Syria, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a human being just like you are. I mean, I, my heartstrings are pulled by what's happening there in the Civil War with so many people being killed, 400 in the past day. I mean, but I think that because of the fact that it's a Civil War, it's none of our business. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think Iran's going to start any wars. They're well aware of the capabilities of the United States. I mean, the submarines that we have have something like 35 multiple nuclear warheads on these missiles that they have under the water, and you can't find these people. And so if they wanted to take out, um, say, six major cities in, in Russia, they could do that. If the, Russia didn't, the Russians didn't shoot it down, and I don't know whether they're capable of doing that. But um, there'd be a lot of damage done if they use that sort of thing. I mean, there'd be hundreds of cities throughout the world that wouldn't be there anymore. There'd be just a hole in the ground. You're right. I mean, the whole situation in the Middle East right now with the situation in uh, Iran, Syria, could lead to, you know, a, a global, you know, thermal nuclear third world war. And we've talked about that several times as well. And I, what do you think they're going to do first if they, if they go after Syria or Iran? Which one do you think is going to be first on their hit list? My guess would be Syria. Now, why, why do they want Syria so badly? I mean, is it because of the of its um, you know the, the position it's in in the in that area? You know, because I know that you know, what I think the, what the Russian Navy has a port there. I mean, is I mean, is that all about uh, strategy? You know, kicking them out or I mean, what's the deal with Syria? Strategic location. Uh, yes, there's a Russian port there. Uh, will Russia defend that port? I think so. And I could start up World War Three. Do they want it now? Are they prepared for it now? And the answer is no. I think they're still dancing around. They may, you know, take Syria, but it might be a year or two before they go after Iran. It's a hard call. We don't have those answers. No, we don't. And- we do know that they're uh, the Mossad and... MI6 and CIA are in there doing all those things you shouldn't be doing. But, you know, are they going to be putting together a long-term program? And the answer is probably yes. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I long for the day, Bob, that we can just leave countries alone, you know, not meddle with them, not go in and cause any, you know, shenanigans or uh, black ops action or coups. Just, let, you know, live and let live. That's the way I want to be. I mean, it's just... It doesn't make us look good in the long term, and it's very hypocritical. And we go around talking about, you know, wanting freedom and liberty for other nations, while at the same time, you know, those freedom and liberties that, you know, our government talks so much about, they're <clears throat> taken away from us on a daily basis. Well, you're right about that. And um, there's so many avenues that, that lead into that. I mean, you can follow lots of them. I mean, even the election in France is important that because of France's uh, influence in that region. Sarkozy's not going to win. Holland is probably going to win, and it's going to be close. And that means that the euro is history, because neither of them want it. And secondly, they want to do away with the European Union. So um, this is like taking a monkey wrench and throwing it into the gears. <laughs> 
a little so sabotage. That'll affect the Middle East too. I, you know, how much and how you know remains to be seen. You know, the expert analysts in that area for the intelligence agency, well, they know, but um, all we can do is guess. Yeah, that's the best we can do, unfortunately, in that situation. And with France, I mean, if it comes really, really close, I mean, what are the chances of there being some, you know, sort of a voter fraud happen there in France? And, I mean, I'm, I would be shocked, too, if Sarkozy got reelected, especially – with uh, his numbers, I mean, he's been going downhill since almost day one of his presidency. There's too many people who want something for nothing, and they need it. They're going to vote for him. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in France, because I, I agree with you, Bob. I think what transpires in France is going to have broad ramifications, not only for uh, Europe as a whole, but for what's transpiring in the Middle East as well. I think it'll have a lot of effect, too, depending upon how far that goes, the whole world. I mean, if they want out of the euro, that's the end. If, you know, the, if Holland or Pen Le Pen tell Merkel, look, we want out. They're going to have to say, okay, we'll leave too. Let's break it up. Take them two or three years to sort it out, but they can break it up. Yeah, and I think it's coming sooner or later. And especially, I think that there's a growing number of people throughout Europe in all these different countries, Germany, France, Greece, Italy, and other other regions of the eurozone are they're they're just they're fed up they they see the eurozone they see the european union as a failure they they want to go back to their currencies they want to go back to their sovereignty and i think that sooner or later you're going to have such a massive protest against the european union throughout europe that uh, they're going to have no choice but to collapse it and that could very well be and uh, that means they're going to have to try to reverse things and that's not going to be easy. I mean, printing money and handing it out to central banks and banks to distribute it is not a good idea. It doesn't work. No, it, it never has. And, Bob, here's a good question. When, when the Eurozone, European Union, does collapse, is, is that going to be um, either a major uh, roadblock for the elite's plans for a global government or is it going to compel them to, you know, go about it a more aggressive way? Repeat that, please. Okay, no problem. Like, if, if and when the European Union falls apart, is it going to be a major roadblock for the elite, the Illuminati's plans towards a one-world government? Or are they going to just be compelled from the fall of the European Union to become more aggressive in their goals? Oh, I think uh, they're going to have to beat a hasty retreat and start rebuilding. And that could take 100 years. I mean, it's the ramifications of the failure of the Eurozone and the European Union would be something that would last a long time. And, um, but I think eventually it's going to happen. It may not happen right now. It, you know, Greece may not go under now. It may go over under in a month and a half. Just, you know, who knows? Yeah, the only time will tell. And... Uh, we haven't really heard much about the, you know, there was a lot of talk years ago about the North American Union, how it was almost intimate. Do, do you think that with what's happening in Greece, that's kind of put a, a huge uh, postponement sticker on uh, the North American Union, or do you think the North American Union's dead, or are they still planning on eventually rolling that out? Uh, they intend to eventually roll it out, and um, they've been delayed. Will it come back? It's hard to tell. What they're doing behind the scenes now is a lot of the work that you don't see. So it'll be ready when they're ready to try again. But then again, if the financial system is changed, then they're not going to be able to do that. Uh, I, I think it's becoming even more difficult for them to accomplish their goals with each passing day. And that's really good news, and it's also testament to what you've been doing for so long and so many others, waking up more people and spreading the truth about what's really going on. And we have just about a minute left, Bob. How can people get the International Forecaster? Well, the forecast is about business, finance, economic, social, and political issues all over the world, published by email on Wednesdays and Saturday. runs around 35 to 40 pages each time. We have a hard copy that goes out twice a month for those who are not on the Internet. Everything you need to know each week is in that publication. You can get a free introductory copy by going to 
theinternationalforecaster.com. The International, F O R E C A S T E R dot com, or to www.intforecaster.com. Intforecaster.com. If you'd like to ask a question and we answer everyone, or if you'd like a copy, or if you'd like a copy of our latest recommendations in gold and silver shares, which have done extraordinarily well, uh, we recommend that you email us, and that address is bob, B-O-B, at I-N-T-F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T-E-R dot com, bob at intforecaster dot com. And for those of you who would like to call toll free, that number is 877-479-8178. That's 877-479-8178. And at that number, you can get the copies. But also, for those of you who would like to become subscribers, they have a special offer, and you can get a full year subscription free. And the deal that they're offering is really terrific. It absolutely is. Bob, thank you so much for joining us this week. I will talk to you next week, sir. Well, thank you very much. 